With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the relationship between Russia and NATO has hit its lowest point since the fall of the Soviet Union. Furthermore, the recent accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO has mostly cut off Russia from accessing the Baltic Sea, apart from the few northern ports and the Kaliningrad Oblast, which has frequently been called one of Russia's main strategic weak points in recent history. But throughout these conflicted times when Russia is struggling to maintain positive relations with countries around the world, it's managed to carve out alliances with some nations that have allowed it to support its war economy, at least in the short term. This was primarily due to China stepping up to replace the EU as Russia's biggest trading partner for oil and natural gas, even if the price that Russia is getting on the Chinese market is much lower than the EU used to pay. However, Russia is not only looking to the east to solve its economic and geopolitical issues. In fact, a tiny island to its north could give Russia the upper hand in its battle with NATO. Recent developments, particularly those regarding global warming, have made Russia more optimistic about controlling the Arctic Circle. But why? You see, while the bulk of international trade between North America, Europe, and Southeast Asia uses the Suez Canal, or in some circumstances, the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, there are two other, lesser-known maritime sea routes. These are the Arctic routes, one off the coast of Russia called the Northeast Passage, and the other off the coast of Canada called the Northwest Passage, both curve around the North Pole. The Northeast Passage holds the Northern Sea Route, the bulk of which passes through Russian-controlled waters off the coast of Siberia and the Far East. The Northern Sea Route has been repeatedly proposed as an alternative to the traditional shipping route via the Suez and Malacca Strait, since it takes roughly 40% less time to traverse during summer time. However, the Northern Sea Route has two major issues. First, the route is frequently icebound during the winter months meaning that trading vessels typically need an icebreaker entourage to be able to make it through the Arctic Circle. Secondly, while the most western end of the route is in Norway-controlled waters, Russia controls the other parts on the Northern Sea Route. Specifically, the small island, technically an archipelago of Svalbard, could prove pivotal in future NATO-Russia relations. Svalbard is an archipelago spanning some 24,000 square miles about the size of Croatia, lying midway between mainland Norway and the North Pole. The archipelago's largest city and administrative center is roughly 520 miles away from the Norwegian mainland. Svalbard is a somewhat unique case in global geopolitics as it's a territory that is governed by Norway, but Norway technically doesn't own it. As such, the archipelago is not part of the Schengen area or the European Economic Area. Instead, the archipelago has special requirements on who can enter and stay there permanently. While there are no limits based on the nationalities of the residents, a vast majority of them are between 25 and 44 years old. Additionally, the archipelago has technically forbidden people from being buried on its grounds. Instead, people with terminal illnesses are advised to leave the island so they can die elsewhere. This is due to Svalbard being positioned in an area with permafrost, which prevents bodies from decomposing and allows them to spread diseases into the environment. The main reason why the island's administration has diverged so much from Norwegian control is the Svalbard Treaty from 1920. Originally, three countries held significant interest in the archipelago, Norway, Sweden, and the Russian Empire. However, talks about jointly governing the islands during the early years of the 20th century came to a halt with the Russian Revolution and the onset of World War I. Following the war, revolutionist Russia was temporarily more interested in resolving its own internal issues than following up on Svalbard. This led to Norway and Sweden to sign the Spitsbergen Treaty without Russia, enacting policies similar to what's in place today. The Russian Empire eventually signed on to the treaty itself. The then foreign minister of Russia claimed that the treaty should be thrown in the trash and that Bear Island belongs to Russia. The foreign minister was referencing Bear Island, the southernmost island of the archipelago, roughly two-thirds of the way between the region's administrative center and mainland Norway. The small island was long considered a separate entity from Svalbard, but was included with it during the talks in the treaty and its administration given to Norway. While the treaty also allows for visa-free travel and stays in Svalbard with specific circumstances such as proof of employment on the island, there have also been instances where Russian diplomats who were barred from entering the EU were also restricted from going to Svalbard. 
Although it has an international community, a few towns in the archipelago hold significant Russian native populations. This is primarily due to Russia owning mineral mines on the islands, which were bought from Norway in the mid-20th century. The Russian communities that were built surrounding the mines have typically waned and towns abandoned. However, the largest mining towns of Pyramidon, now abandoned, and Berensburg, the second largest settlement on the archipelago with a population of roughly 450, are still vital to Russia's international interests. Pyramidon is primarily designed as a tourist attraction, containing the northernmost bust of in the world. Berensburg still contains an integrated Russian community and is a source of coal for northern European countries and Russia. Before Russia connected the northern cities of Momansk and Arkhangelsk to the more popular centers such as Moscow and St. Petersburg via trains, coal from Svalbard was the primary way these northern cities generated energy and powered their industries. The cities are also vital as some of Russia's largest and most populous ports on the Arctic Ocean. Additionally, the Kola Peninsula, the northwesternmost part of Russia, contains several nuclear weapon sites and military bases making it of utmost importance for Russian military strategies. As a result, during the 20th century, Russia invested significant funds into keeping the mining settlements in Svalbard prosperous, which in turn propped up the industry and military complexes on its mainland. Svalbard is also considered pivotal in Russia's attempts to control the Arctic Ocean. Without direct control over Svalbard, the Arctic coast of Russia and its military bases would be easy pickings for NATO offensives that use northern Norway or Svalbard itself as a supply point. To get around this point of contention, the Svitsbergen Treaty also forbids all military presence on the Svalbard archipelago, preventing any country that has a claim on the island from establishing bases or even performing military drills and exercises in surrounding waters. However, Norway, as its governing entity, often patrols the archipelago with Coast Guard vessels. Ostensibly, this is part of the Norwegian efforts to ensure that Svalbard remains free from permanent military setups and a big part of projecting control over the islands. And additionally, Norway has also instituted border regimes where Russian citizens who were forbidden from entering the EU, such as expelled diplomats, were also prevented from traveling to the archipelago. This came to a head in 2015, when then-Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Ragazin visited the island. Norway responded by further tightening the visa regime for Russian citizens to the archipelago and threatened them with deportations. Russia hasn't taken kindly to the fact that Norway has seemingly free reign to parade its vessels so close to the Russian Arctic ports, nor with tightening visa requirements for its citizens. Russia considered these moves as antithetical to the treaty. In fact, they also expressed similar concerns during the actual signing in 1935. As mentioned before, Norway argues that the presence of its coastal guard vessels isn't a warlike stance and thus completely obeys the Svalbard Treaty. Russia has also complained about the Norwegian satellite base located on the island, among the largest satellite bases in the world and which provides ground services to multiple satellite companies. Russia asserted that the satellites were being used for military purposes, which Norway has vehemently denied every time and manifested its obligations as outlined in the treaty. Another country that has also shown interest in Svalbard is China. The country has raised concerns over whether the research settlements on the archipelago, particularly in Ialison to the north, are properly allowing for the creation of a truly international community. On the surface, this might seem like an innocuous issue. However, China has been more involved in the geopolitics surrounding the Arctic Circle in recent years, particularly with regard to their rights and interests in the region. The country has an Arctic policy from 2018, which invokes the Svalbard Treaty six times in an attempt to legitimize the Chinese rights on policies surrounding the Arctic, even though the area is far away and completely detached from China's international waters or holdings. China operates a few research teams on Svalbard but its goal seems to be to use this presence to further legitimize itself as a near-Arctic state and carve a piece of geopolitical influence that surrounds the Arctic region. If you're wondering why we seem to suddenly switch to China in a NATO-Russia conversation, the reason is quite simple. Over the course of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, China and Russia have announced a potentially unending partnership and alliance bolstered by shared values and trade deals between the countries. 
China is ostensibly using Russia's access to the Northern Sea Route in an attempt to shore up one of its significant weaknesses to the south, the Malacca Strait. Both the U.S. and India, two of China's largest rival economies and militaries in the world, maintain a stranglehold on that strait and are thus potentially able to control the trade that passes through it. Currently, the Malacca Strait is responsible for more than 60% of maritime trade coming into China, particularly natural resources. A U.S. blockade of the strait would severely limit China's ability to maintain its industry-based economy. As such, China, in a push for more rights and freedoms through the Arctic, could bypass a potential Malacca blockade and allow itself to retain its influence over Western Europe by creating a more lucrative trade route through the Northern Sea Route. Since China and Russia are broiled in an alliance, it's difficult to ascertain just how much of Russia's actions surrounding Svalbard are actually in service to China as one of its biggest trading partners and one of the reasons why it can sustain its war effort for so long. Apart from complaints about Norwegian jurisdictions and adherence to the Svalbard Treaty, there's an ongoing dispute over who controls the waters surrounding the archipelago. The draft of the treaty is ambiguous on the matter since the 200 nautical mile maritime zone surrounding the archipelago is never mentioned as belonging to a particular jurisdiction.